just real quickly, I'll do an intro myself because um, I don't think I actually had like a, an intro slide. Um, my name is Mike Spaulding. I've been doing this way too long. Um, I'm not going to sell you anything. I don't care what you buy. You can buy whatever you feel like. I don't really care what you buy. You can do it by scratch. Build your own. Why not? Um, so I do security strategy architecture, company confidential. If you want to talk later, we'll talk later. Um, it's a fun place. We get to do neat things. Uh, I always put this disclaimer in, even though this is a pretty soft talk in, in my opinion. Um, what you do with your business is up to you. Don't come back to me in three months and say, I got fired following your advice, just FYI. Uh, <laughs> I've had too many friends fired. <laughs> too many friends that, you know, done things that, you know, think before you act. That's the, that's the general theme here. So, what are we going after here? We're talking about building an application security program. My perspective on this is not, you know, hey, I need to do SQL injection, let's talk about cross-site server scripting. We have Google, you can go find out all you want to know about that. My take on this is, how do I get a program up? What do I need to do to get people convinced? And where do I need to go to kind of get the dollars going? Um, but when we think about it, we think about bad guys, path of least resistance, you got to remember, when we're, when we're thinking like the bad guy, they're going to launch an attack, they're going to go after the, the, the next weakness in line, they're going to violate a control, they're going to deviate from some function, and then boom, they're going after your data. I think everybody here gets that. Um, I always put this in here because what I'm hoping that you could use this for is the slide deck to convince your own management. Some of it you might have to massage. I've got like my elevator pitch that I've made. But the whole plan of this is you'll be able to use this to hopefully convince your own management to do application security. Um, I think the, uh, there we go. Um, you have to throw that in there or else the business doesn't get it. They'll ask you like, like, why do I care about application security or why do I care about security in general? Well, this is generally how they work their way through the system, okay? So when we think about it, We've all seen this before. I'm, I, is anybody new to the OS Top 10? It used to be called the, uh, the Seven Deadly Sins. It's evolved over the years, right? Lots of different ways people look at it. But we, again, we've got these vulnerabilities out there. What do people attack these days? They attack everything from IoT to, to vehicles. You name it, they're attacking it. Why not? Well, think about it. It's got a web server. Why not attack it? Um, you know, back in the day um, when I was back at Chase, we used to go in and actually change each other's phone or names on the phones so that when people would call, uh, it would come up with some obscene name and then your boss, you'd call your boss with this obscene name and your boss is like, why are you calling me with this obscene name? So we get each other into trouble a little bit. Did the same thing with pagers, all that type of stuff. It was all web-based. We went into a web server that was wide open and we just messed with each other. Well, now everything has a web server. All right, so this is a slide I want to point out that I think is absolutely critical. The goal of application security is to reduce risk. It will never get you to point zero. You'll never be at completely no risk. Now, why is that important? A lot of people sell this as their solution as being a, oh, we, we guarantee risk. Nobody can guarantee you that your, your risks are going away. But at the same time, you've got to convince your management to spend an X amount of money. Okay, I want to get to point D on this graph. If I get to point, you know, if I look on here, I look at point B, I'm spending a lot of money and yeah, I'm reducing my risk down to some low level over here. If you look at the bottom right there on, on, in the red, but it's to a level that essentially they're probably not going to be okay with. Now, if you're with the NSA or you're with somebody who basically money is no option, hey, go all the way down to D. Nobody's going to care cutting in and out. Nobody's going to care what you spend, right? That's actually how they sell you to go to the NSA. Come to the NSA and guess what? You kind of get unlimited budget to a certain degree. You can have a lot of fun. We just won't pay you well. So most places what they're looking to achieve is they're looking to achieve D. They want to reduce the risk down to a manageable level where they can afford it. That's really where you're shooting for. You can't spend infinite amount of dollars to essentially drive everything, you know, to this insane amount of spending. Most companies don't have it. Even the company I work for right now is a global 50 company. Trying to get them to create an application security program has been a challenge. Okay? 
It seems simple, but trust me, you, you think about scope creep, it'll destroy any program. It, it just takes it over overnight. It, it's, it's incredible. We're going to talk about a couple basics. Some of you may know these. Um, last speaker, it seemed like he was talking a combination of kind of both of these things together. Um, I'm actually ironically going to talk about uh, security automation, but I'm going to completely do it from a different perspective in Baltimore. So anyhow, dynamic assessment, static assessment, we're going to go through that. It's important to, enter, to know the difference between app security and pen testing. I can't tell you how many times even vendors that sell this stuff don't differentiate between those two. They try to sell you pen testing, but they're an application security vendor and they, they start blurring, blur, ugh, blurring the lines really bad. Um, along with vulnerability management. I see those three spaces constantly getting I don't know, abused. They're constantly getting um, uh, just I don't even know how to describe it. I just see such bleed over between the three programs that at the end everyone's talking this poor language and nobody really knows what the hell they're talking about. Easiest way to put it. So, static analysis. We think of like code testing. This is the stuff that, you know, from an automation perspective, I used to love to automate. I still would prefer to automate. At the same time, I will emphasize, uh, and I'll disagree with the previous speaker. I, I don't like to to you know get into things with speakers, but um, to me this is important enough that I would train my developers to try to write better code. That's just my own perspective. Yes, <laughs> right. Oh, we'll take them at the end. I think it'll be easier, and then that way we can knock them out. And if we run out of time, we'll go out in the hallway. But the thing is, is that I guess to me the whole importance of, of training is the fact that you have it. And, and the developers need to know how to correct themselves. If I just let the developers keep making the same mistakes, um, what I'm going to have is I'm going to have the same quality product over and over again, and I'm going to be reinventing the wheel. We'll talk about that a little bit later on from a perspective of kind of Kaizen. We're going to throw that wonderful term in there. But when I think about you know static analysis, I think about sanitizing the data input from an end user's perspective. It's critical. It's less restrictive to the data input, the greater the opportunity for abuse. I kind of put these little red things at the bottom right now as like the gist of what we're going after. The big thing I would say from a static analysis perspective, development perspective, the cleaner I can get the data input, the better I can sanitize that, generally speaking, the fewer headaches I have. Now, it's not a guaranteed, you know, it's always going to work that way, but it does cut my headaches down a lot. If you get a good, a good set of developers over time, they'll realize this. They'll start to, you know, coding towards your way, and eventually, that's kind of where you're trying to go towards. Is you become what I call the Maytag repairman. You run your assessments, and you're bored off your mind because you're like, this is just not fun anymore. It's actually why I left the company once. So dynamic analysis. This is what we all think about the fun stuff. This is where we're all like, you know, I'm a hacker. Um, I can see Phil over there laughing at me. Um, you know, the dynamic analysis is where I get to go up against the website, get to beat up on it. Um, you know, I'll, I'll go ahead and, and I'll try to do my SQL injection. I'll try to do my, uh, you know, my cross-site server scripting and, and, and trying to explain that to developers I, I oftentimes find is one of the most difficult challenges because they're like, well, who cares? It's just cross-site server scripting. Eh, who cares? Um, don't even try to explain it to management. It's just pointless. They, they, they usually don't even know, like, what's an input field? So this is, this is usually the, the glamorous side of, of, the, of the I'm going to be doing some security testing culture, right? Uh, it's important, but at the same time, it's not the end-all be-all. Uh, oftentimes, again, this is automated. A lot of people will go out there and run this and say, hey, here you go. Here's your assessment. And um, they'll hand it to you, and you'll go, I could have done that. In fact, we had a 15-year-old at one of the places where I used to work doing just that. It's not really that hard. Um, he was an intern. It's not a hard thing to do. So, when I think about the components of AppSec, I think about web applications, I think about the client server apps. A lot of people forget about client server apps. It's amazing. Just because of the fact that the web is where it is, doesn't mean I have to neglect my client server applications. There are tool sets out there to go ahead and hit client server apps. Um, it's a little more infrequent, but they do exist. Also, my mobile apps, my middleware, and any type of cryptographic analysis, that's kind of my general catch-all I throw for network. Hopefully, you're encrypting certain traffic over the network, at least your IDs and passwords. But, hey, 
you got to look at that type of stuff. All those kind of things kind of roll into what I would call an application security assessment. Okay? Vulnerability testing ensures that no two components along with the app when placed together do not create known vulnerabilities. So finally at the end, I take all this together, I slap it together, and I just make sure that I haven't created a vulnerability that I'm, not, I'm unaware of. Okay? And again, I, I, wanna, I wanna hit it throughout the stages. So, what I'll do with that manual step is I'm gonna smoke test and make, that, make sure that the final product has no anomalies. I have, I've discovered as many things as I can possibly find and I'm willing to live with it. Again, I'm trying to get myself down to that D point in the graph. I'm trying to get myself down to that lowest point where I've spent as much money as I'm willing to spend and I'm willing to let the, the product roll forward. So I'll go through here and I'll, I'll try to beat up on it. I'll see what I can find. Um, uh, manual testing is slow. But it's probably the most important thing. To me, you can automate static testing, you can automate the dynamic stuff, but this is where I use those findings to go through and to actually validate whether they were useful or not. Did they help me out or not? A lot of people, will, again, what they'll do is they'll like, well, the developer ran the static test, that's nice. Um, the intern ran the dynamic test, again, that's nice. But I need to go through and actually have a human set of eyes look at that material and find out if there's some pieces I can put together to make something bad. That's really all it gets back to. All right. Kaizen, continuous improvement. Why is this important? Um, essentially, and again, I, I, I don't know about the, the, the previous speaker's business model, but my take is, is that we want to put ourselves into the position of becoming the Maytag repairman. If I do it right, my workload should decrease over time. And these guys know that, that, that I got really bored at a number of different companies that I worked for <laughs> over time. Because you get it to a point where the developers are, de are developing nice tight code, um, the vulnerabilities aren't being found, you're not finding, you're really not finding much, it's just boring. So you're, you're doing a job that you really don't enjoy anymore and, and maybe it's time that you bring in some other talent to go ahead and do that. But I want to keep going through this whole process of PDCA, Plan, Do, Check, Act, okay? This recursive process of making myself get better. Why? Because that's how you make things improve in your environment. Um, I'm not just going to run security once and just walk away from it. That's the problem. A lot of people think, well, we got a security program up and going. Yes, but the bad guy, you know, they're always going to that next level. Um, it's amazing, and, 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 and even in my current role, I'm, I'm talking with people who are, who are of like a 1990s mindset, because um, that's really when they were doing most of their technical work. Um, they're in a, that 90s mindset, and they're kind of like, well, you know, we're doing this and we're doing this, and I'm like, that's great, but the only bad thing is all the bad guys, they've evolved for like the last 20 years. They've moved themselves up to this level while you guys stayed right down here. It's, it's, it's the truth. But you know, security is a, is a cat and mouse game. They're always upping the game. So when I start looking at this, you know, what will I go after? Maybe I'll start with my annual assessment of internet facing apps. I'll go after RTO zero apps. Um, you know, those apps that are critical. Um, I'll go after my apps that contain uh, PII, uh, you know, PCI, uh, intellectual property, anything with value. Um, in addition to that, ad hoc assessments. The way I'll kind of structure it is I would go after new applications first, I'd go after those ones going through significant upgrades, and I'd go through my emerging technologies. Things that are going through like a slight upgrade, I may not spend the effort to go ahead and run my actual assessment against. It's kind of pointless. It's, the value proposition just isn't there. Um, all the while I'm doing this, I do want to define some metrics, okay? Because I need feedback. I can't tell you how many times I've seen programs fail because they're not showing and again, it's just how the business world works. They want to see what are you improving upon? What, what are you catching? What are you finding? They want to see what am I spending you know, a half million to a million dollars on? People don't put together metrics. You need to know what your, your essentially your app set KPIs are, and that's actually a, a good discussion if somebody wants to make one. You know, have, a good, have an hour long talk on app set KPIs. Okay? But know what my KPIs are, know what my metrics are, and then make sure that feedback kind of gets back put into the loop and people know what's going on. So, other considerations to, to think about. Training, uh, as I mentioned earlier, train your developers. There's no point in having them go through this whole process. Um, 
just to keep kind of spinning the wheel over and over again. Train your developers. Uh, go through a, the way I used to do it at, at the second mo the third most recent job um, was I actually had like a lead developer lead developer uh, uh, kind of cleared code. So on a weekly basis, they would go through and they'd run the automatic uh, scan. They'd run it through all the code. He'd also, you know, train those uh, more junior developers, make sure that they were solid. Um, and essentially, over time, they became valuable because they actually could develop secure code, at least better secure code. And people found out about it, so they started stealing all their people away. But it's going to be this process where you're going to constantly be training people. The training never ends. So create like that lead type of program with your, with your developers. But at the same time, make sure that, you know, your staff has proper training. The bad guys are always, you know, well trained because they have a financial incentive to. But go through that from a staffing perspective. Make sure that you have plenty of resources. Um, operational security. I do throw this in there because a lot of people forget about this. Application security is not a substitute for a next generation type of firewall. And I'm not here to sling you a next generation type of firewall. I'm just trying to tell you that, um, again, from a metrics perspective, it would be good to see how much kind of hits your front doorstep and why your application security program is valuable. That's how you can basically address it with your management. What, uh, you know, why am I doing this application security, you know, program to begin with? Well, look at the metrics on the firewall. Look at all these attacks that are constantly hitting our boxes. Again, application security is not a substitute for doing thorough operation security. Um, I always throw in there data loss prevention because if you really do data loss prevention well, you'll, you'll see where people are stealing this stuff out from underneath you. Um, <laughs> and then finally, vendor management. When you get to a point of maturity within your application security program, and we're going to kind of take a couple, another dive into this in a second. But when you think about vendor management, you know, you're going to get really bored if you start doing this well enough. If you start setting up a team and you start going through this, you're going to want to eventually go after your vendors. Why not? They have an obligation to essentially deliver you a solid piece of software. And a lot of people are surprised to find out that a lot of vendors don't do any security testing. Surprise, surprise. Um, so from a vendor management perspective, you kind of become a mini consulting shop. You get to find out who is uh, telling you the truth on their testing and who's not, or who's, who's got a bad vendor for themselves and, and, and really who's delivering. Um, this whole talk and when we talk about this, we could spend an hour on this. We could spend an entire day talking about this slide alone. Just on how to manage a team. But we kind of just covered it in probably three or four minutes and that's about all we have, uh, unfortunately. If anybody wants to talk later on, we can talk later more about it. So, I actually stole this from Chris Weiss of Paul at Veracode. Okay? Uh, it was a good little uh, website uh, or a little uh, post he put out on dark reading, but his steps are really solid. Okay, so start simple, start small. Can't emphasize that enough. Too many people are like, I've got to sell my business to Taj Mahal. I've got to convince them to go spend a million and a half on application security. Doesn't work like that. Most businesses want to gingerly wade their way into it. Okay, so. When we talk about application security, you've got to start to get that buy-in. Um, I'll be honest with you. There's a lot of scissors that don't get it. There's a lot of scissors that I, as, as jokingly I told him earlier, I personally don't want to work for another CISO ever again, simply because of the fact that I'm tired of training scissors. Um, application security is, uh, is something of a, of a, unless a person's technical, they're probably not going to get it. And explaining it to them is a very difficult task. But you've got to start small, and you've got to start with simple means of, of helping them understand the data loss. Okay? Um, so you have to convey those risks well enough to the business. Um, this is actually a good one to also emphasize. The business is out to sell widgets, right? They sell insurance. They sell healthcare products. They deliver healthcare. They do whatever it is they do. Very few people in here probably actually deliver security services unless you're a consultant or a vendor, right? Your company is to do whatever it is. People forget about that. So you've got to convince them why they got to go spend a half million dollars to do something that you want to do because it's going to save X, Y, and Z. You've got to build that value proposition. So policy standards, why they matter. Um, 
really, when you think about it, during the two uh, earliest stages of any type of you know development, you know we get into project definition, system overview. If I haven't de defined application security well enough, I'm probably going to live with those sins the rest of the the application process. And we're going to go through an SDLC here in a second, but. I've got to I've got to convey to people exactly what I'm looking for, and typically this is done. You know, this is where I'm, I'm at. Think of it like an architecture review one, or some type of early architecture review. This is where I'm going to go through and I'm going to define what's expected. If the developers do not know what is expected, they're going to deliver what they've been told to deliver, whether um, whether you like it or not. So now you're you're essentially hoping. I want to go in there early on and I want to tell them. Here's exactly what my expectations are of your code. Here is it that I'm expecting to happen on a weekly basis, a monthly basis, and at the end, here's what we're going to do. Okay? Your greatest ability to influence any project starts at the very beginning. If you wait until the 11th hour and you try to say, hey, NASA, we have a problem, guess what the management is probably going to tell you? Sorry, we got to go. We're going live. Oops. Unless you can prove something very, very bad. Why metrics matter? From a budget standpoint, you have to show a return on investment. That's why. It's just as simple as that. I got to show an ROI. If I don't show an ROI, nobody cares. Produce those metrics weekly, monthly, however often you can meet with your management and help them understand that. Uh, even as a, even as a, if, uh, has anyone ever been laid off before? Couple of people like, you. well, I have, and I tell you right now, it sucks. Okay, and you know what? The biggest failure I had at the age of 26 of getting laid off was that I was doing all this great work. In fact, I was helping other people on my team. The only problem was my management didn't see it. Guess what happened? They laid off the golden goose. The amount of money I was making them, they were, they later on, they they closed up the whole line of business, and it wasn't just because of me, but it was because of the fact that. I wasn't conveying the metrics to them to let them know exactly what I was doing. And, and in the end, I, I kind of screwed myself. Metrics kind of define whether you're valuable or not. You have to show it to them and you have to constantly let them know that. Um, so finally, we need to align app, AppSec with your uh, SDLC. Okay, So we all have seen this before. Design, build, test, deploy, operate. Sound familiar? Kind of generic, universal enough? All right. So what you'll see in here is, is that I've kind of got this generically defined right now. So I've got like in design, I've got my like architecture review. I'm going to go through an internal review. I'm going to set my expectations in here. Uh, at static testing, I'm going to go through and make sure that developers are at least doing some bit of static testing. Make sure that I know what's going on with their code. What are they, are they really keeping their commitments? And then finally, when I get towards that test deploy phase, I'm going to do my dynamic testing. And then you can eventually evolve to pen testing, going into other areas. And as new versions happen, I come back and I do that plan, do, check, act. I come back to zero, and I essentially do the process all over again. I know some developers are like, oh, no, not, all, not doing security all over again. Hopefully, the second time around, it's a lot easier. And usually, it goes much more quickly. There we go. So I've kind of got these written out right here of these steps. Okay, steps one through six. It might be easier just to go ahead and kind of lay it out on here, right? So you kind of look, go through here and you see that uh, essentially I'm, I'm in my an early analysis uh, architecture phases. I mean, you know, whether, whatever you call it, J0, J1, um, if you use JFlow, whatever, whatever it is, okay? Where I'm at, we use something called JFlow. It's cool, it works. Um, but what I'm going to do is I'm going to essentially go back into here and I'm going to reset those expectations right? during the architectural solution. I'm going to essentially say, here's my expectations at the end. Here's what I want to see. Um, this is usually where most people lie to me as, a, as an architect or, or anybody who's in that type of role. Uh, they lie often. <laughs> um, and again, assistance during high-level, low-level design. I want to make sure that you know they're going to do certain things. Maybe I want them to encrypt the traffic. Um, I might want them also to run weekly assessments. Um, they have to be in compliance with SOX during you know J2, J3, J4, uh, with a final SOX assessment at J5. 
Uh, it just depends on how I'm, how I'm going to attack that problem. I'll go through and I'll say I want my static code uh, testing to happen, or my, at least my st static, uh, static uh, security scanning to hap happen there. Dynamic uh, testing happen at stage four. Uh, web vulnerabilities, mobile vulnerabilities, I'll hit that at like five, and then I'll go through a manual test at six. So when you see this, I should be involved in all these phases. Application security should be in every step of it. From a practical standpoint, and, and again, I don't know how much time we have, but from a practical standpoint, um, and recently what I proposed at a company that I'm at is to start out with two application security testing type people and to have one project liaison person. And they're like, why do I need this third person? Because I don't want to tie up the time of the application security people to sit in on these meetings. That liaison person should hopefully be able to translate things and act as a go-between. They don't have to be overly technical, they're fairly cheap, but they need to be a little bit more managerial. Why? Because the time of these apps, these app testers I don't want them to spend time in meetings. I want them to be testing apps, okay? And I think the, the total number I threw out there is over time, we can get to the point where they're gonna do, in 20 hours a week, roughly one app. Now, granted, is it too small, too big? It depends on the size of the app, but over an average, I found that, yeah, typically, a single app sec person who isn't getting tied up in meetings can do about 100 apps in a year. Estimate two weeks of vacation, 50 weeks in a year, I'm going to get through roughly almost 100 apps. So if I want to do 200 apps, well, yeah, again, when you think about it, when I do run you know, the static testing, a lot of that should already have been done ahead of time by my developers. I would hand that off to my developers and let them run with it and just make sure my developers aren't cheating me. And then at the end, this really where step six is, that's where I'm bringing in my people to do that 20 hours of testing. They look through all the results. They look, may make sure that the last static scan, everything looks clean. Uh, if not, if there's something critical, they throw it back hopefully by then. And that's really what that liaison would do. And then finally, uh, you know, they'll bless it and move it on. Um, you know, the, the big thing I always tell developers is that, you know, I used to have a guy, and I don't see him here. His name's Mr. Osborne. I'll just leave it at that. He used to come over to me and he's like, sir, can you do the, and pardon my app. Um, it was kind of funny because, he literally was like, I want to get your buy off so then that way later on I don't have to get yelled at if something bad happens. Once that relationship gets to that point, you know usually people are counting on you. You're delivering some better apps. At least that's, that's how I viewed it as. When you get to the point where you're completely bored off your mind, then you've probably achieved your goals. Now, we say trust but verify. Um, a quick question. Does anybody know which president kind of coined that phrase? Reagan, yeah. Yeah, trust but verify. So once it's off and running, where will the risk move to? Well, here's the thing. Risk is like a demon. You're chasing this demon around. Risk is going to move. You might start with the external apps, and then the risk moves to the internal apps, and then from the internal apps it becomes the vendor apps. You're chasing this demon around. You're going to constantly go looking for risk. Okay? Um, you're going to start to ask yourself, what's an opportunity to assess? Well, maybe the IP phone system might be my next opportunity to really have some fun and to show the management just how good we are. You can take application security as far as you want to take it. The reality is that almost everything has a web server on it, right? Cars have web servers. I mean, think about that, that little notion, right? Um, you know, has anyone been in a Tesla? Tell me it's not running a web server. So, require your vendor perform verification. Um, the biggest thing you'll find is your vendors will be lying to you. Uh, at least a lot of them, not all of them. A number of them will. I uh, can't tell you how many, how many security vendors have been popped in the last year. Does anybody know? Too many. There you go. That's the correct answer. There's too many security vendors that have been popped in the last year. So, again, start putting some pressure on your vendors. And, and, and really where I drive this towards is this. As I find the vulnerabilities, as, as I find these weaknesses in the vendor apps, that's when I go back and I tell procurement during renegotiations, hey, guess what? We're paying for a crappy application. We're buying some, you know, some product that's inferior. We should be getting some serious discounts. And either put the burden back on the vendor to give you, you know, that superior product that you need, or you put the burden back on the vendor to cut the, cut the, 
the price down to a level that you're okay to, to live with. Uh, and I've had a vendor before go, well, you know, what's it going to matter to you guys whether or how much you pay? I, I told him really quite simply, my view on that is, is that now I need to spend more on operational security to cover your weaknesses. So you're helping to pay for that next generation firewall where you're paying for whatever, you know, cloud web service to essentially filter out the attacks that are going to try to exploit your poorly written code. So, again, you can, you can drive this stuff down to as far as you want to take it. Um, you know, a good application security program, typically they're not bored. Um, let's see here. Again, your, your vendor is going to look at AppSec as an expense. So they have to do the exact same thing. They got to get to the level D. Sometimes their level D is more like your level A. Like they don't want to spend hardly any money because they're looking to, you know, pay for that new yacht. So considerations. I do want to call out something because I've, uh, I've seen this before. People will sometimes lump application security into the QA department. It's a bad idea in my opinion. Could you do it? Yeah, you could do it. Um, however, uh, QA is going for a different set of goals compared to application security. There is some crossover in maybe techniques and style and, 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 and how you achieve your goals. However, my goals and QA's goals are completely separate. Okay? And you might need to tell CIOs that because, again, a lot of CIOs, a lot of CISOs don't know that. They're like, oh, well, I'll just throw it in the QA and, you know, hey, it's all the same stuff. The QA is just trying to basically find out how far can I take it before the app breaks. I'm trying to see how quickly I can steal all the data and walk away with it. Because I don't care if it breaks. In fact, I don't want it to break. I want to steal all your data and essentially become a, a rich man living on a beach. That's all they're looking for. Um, over time, what can I do? If I don't have a QA program, maybe stand one up. I'd help them create a separate program. Um, also, is it maybe time to create an internal red team, the purple team of sorts, I guess? How you want to phrase it anymore? Uh, maybe it's time to set up that internal red team. I'd want to go through and say, hey, you know, maybe this is where I really do an official pen testing team. And, um, you know, we're going to take, you know, where we're in, you know, production and we're going to take it to the next level. And I'm going to exploit people along with technology. All right, so I do want to have a shameless plug, and then we're going to start answering questions. I think we're on time, I hope. Sweet, we're right on time. Uh, Columbus B-Sides, if you don't know about it, it's a, another security conference. We usually have it in January. We just got kicked out of our last venue, so congratulations to us. Um, <laughs> it happens. Perception of, of, of people doing bad things, right? Um, we're intentionally going to try to avoid the ShmooCon weekend this next round. If you know what ShmooCon is, great. Uh, we usually have three tracks of security goodness. And uh, we have nice badges. It's Doge approved. Uh, we have fun. We have a good time. It's like 20 bucks. I think this year is 25 maybe. But uh, again, if you ever have a chance, go to a B-side. They're great. They're great events. I think the next closest one is uh, Cincinnati's in May and uh, Cleveland's is in June. So go out to the B-Sides website and check it out. Um, I'll be talking in Baltimore about security automation. I'm not going to talk about what that gentleman before me talked about, because that, to me, was unique. Unique, that's all I'll say about it. Um, but uh, I've got to work on some slides. Later this summer, who knows? I don't know where it'll take me. Um, I'm going to probably do the security automation talk twice. Uh, you can uh, link in with me. You can follow me on Twitter. I will warn you on Twitter. I'm obscene. I'm not a light, nice person. Um, I say off the cuff remarks that you probably shouldn't say, and it's probably detrimental to my career, but it is who I am. Uh, if you have questions, feel free to ask me afterwards. Uh, hit me up on LinkedIn. Uh, just one thing I do want to uh, advise people on, that questions become consulting. Consulting is a whole other thing. That's a whole other animal. And I have been duped into the... Uh, into the uh, uh, thing before where essentially I've been brought in for an interview so that people could understand how to do application security and that was a, a bit frustrating. So later on when it came time for them trying to really find the application security people after they miserably failed, I told the recruiter, oh by the way. So, you know, just understand that uh, consulting is a whole other animal. So questions?
Um, well, here's hopefully, hopefully you have an approval step. So if you go back to this SDLC, hopefully, if if I'm if I've stood it up correctly, you see where it's like number six implementation, number five, right in there. Hopefully, at that point, that's where I'm basically given the green light to move forward. If I don't have that green light opportunity, some people will call that like an architecture review two or however you don't want to define it. Um, but hopefully I have the ability to veto at this point. If you have that ability to veto, that's really where you want it at. Because I've seen this before too. I've seen a lot of people, you go through this whole process, they get the J0, J1, they get their approval, and then guess what they do? They go off and they spend your money and they do something completely different. They do it. People do it all the time. Why? Because nobody's looking. And then later on you find out when they're in implementation, Oh, yeah, well, you know what? We went back to what we wanted to do anyways. And, well, sorry, sorry about your luck. Oh, and we spent all the money too. But J or at that, uh, basically between uh, code test and implementation, you should have a veto power. That's where you got to drop it in. Um, that's a good question. It depends on the situation of where I'm going with. Um, Hmm, how do I want to even answer this without getting too vendorish? So, when it comes to my vendors these days, I'd want an external scanner, kind of like a Veracode or check marks. I'd run them through there. Um, which one works better? Uh, I am, in general, fairly neutral um, because I think that in most cases, people fail. Technology is usually technology. They all kind of do about the same thing. There might be some better bells and whistles with one product versus another. Uh, it used to be uh, the, the old Fortify product. Uh, did really well with the uh, um, the Java side of the house to a certain degree, and then what was previously Ounce Labs, now the IBM security product, um, it did a slightly better job with .NET. Those could have changed, and they probably have, to be honest with you. Um, if I could propose anything in an environment, especially when it comes to things like this, to me, application security is kind of a niche thing. It's not like doing firewalls. It's not like doing vulnerability management. I would probably try to have as many different products and diversity as possible. Okay, so you know how I did that? Was that my, with my lead program, their bonuses were tied back to how good they were doing their application security scans. So, so again, I go back to my program here where I'm like, you know, I'm going to go ahead and uh, I'm going to have my lead kind of act as that, that big brother of sorts to make sure that people are doing it right, I'm going to have that lead, his bonus is going to be tied to 20% how low they can meet the metrics. Now, is it possible the lead could cheat me? Yes. So what do I need to do? I need to go in and audit the lead stuff every now and then. I need to make sure that the, my lead's not lying. I'd even tell the lead I'm coming in to do it. I'm like, yeah, I'm coming in to check code this, this Friday. Just FYI, and all of a sudden you might see him start scrambling. <laughs> you know, but uh, but again, uh, it's funny because people are like, uh, you know, how do I get people to take se security seriously? It's simple: tie it back to money, tie it back to a bonus. Hey, security is fifteen percent of your problems, fifteen percent of your bonus, or fifteen percent of your pay is this. You can't do it. Guess what? What's sad is a lot of CIOs won't do it. Um, but if you're in a place where it's really critical, they will. You can convince them otherwise. But yeah, when it comes to products, I would say diversify as much as possible. I mean, I hate to say it, but when it comes right down to it, most people can do almost all this stuff with free tools out on the web. You can use Burp. You can use a lot of different things. It's all free, or at least near free. I mean, 300 bucks or whatever they want for Burp is pretty, pretty low in my opinion. So, Was it just a static tools you had a question on, or dynamic, or both, or... Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I know what you mean. Um, like I said, again, what I did is I drove it towards like this lead program. So the leads essentially started educating the developers on how to do better coding. And and unlike again, I, I'm not trying to be harsh on the previous you know speaker, but you know when it came to to training the developers, it really wasn't that bad. 
The developers just need to know what to look for. They need to know what, what to do. And most developers, I generally find 90% of the people are fairly accommodating and they're fairly good people. You know, it's that 5 to 10% that are going to do things where, you know, they're in a bind or they don't really care. I don't think anybody says, I don't want to do the security. I mean, necessarily. I mean, they may say, like, I don't want to do it right now. Um, you know, and I have developers well enough to know that they're trying to get things done, and, and I completely appreciate that. But um, in general, what I've found is, is that if I create an environment where I kind of have an opportunity for people to, to peer check, generally speaking, they don't want to be that person who's now wasting somebody else's time. So constantly run people through peer checks. And, and, and I wouldn't even say the word probably isn't constantly. It's more like just run them through you know, a, a, the number that makes you makes your company feel comfortable type of peer checks. It's not going to be perfect. You're going to always have somebody who could cheat the system. So, yeah. Any last questions? Yeah, actually, uh, I'm going to put them out on, on through, like, SlideShare. They'll be on LinkedIn. So uh, if anybody actually wants to see, like, how we used to do it at uh, Chase, um, Way back when, um, we actually have like 300 and some slides where we go through the whole thing. This is actually what we use. It's out on SlideShare right now. Um, I don't think Chase cares because it's been like 12 years, right? Um, but it's out on SlideShare right now. Uh, it's what we used to use to train the, the developers on to say, hey, here's what we're looking at. Here's how we're looking at attacking these problems. Um, we kind of used it as like a lunch and learn. So essentially over the period of uh, about four weeks, over twi two hours a week, we, you know, we paid for the lunch. It was, you know, it was probably the best $1,000 spent was buying these developers lunch. They went through and they actually started listening to us. And then guess what? Eventually over time, we, we became the Maytag repairman. We were bored because there was nothing left to fix. You know, the vendors hated us. So that was fun. But yeah, they'll be, they'll be on SlideShare. They're, they're, like I said, there's a good one out there with uh, Chase on the app, sec app security side. Lots of people don't realize that it's out there, and it's completely, it's still very pertinent, even though it was 12 years ago, because the techniques really haven't changed dramatically. The web, you know, the web technology has, but uh, to a certain degree, but it's just gotten a little bit more integrated. That's one thing I would say that when I go looking for tools, and I, what I would do when it came to buying a set of tool sets, I would look for the, the word to me would be the word integration. How can I get it to integrate in with, you know, Certain things like Jenkins, how can I get it to integrate in with certain technologies that I'm using internally? If I'm a big IBM shop, maybe they've got it tied back into the, uh, you know, the QA uh, cycle and some of the, uh, you know, the, the various IBM, uh, you know, development tool sets that they have anymore, which are constantly changing names, it seems like. But if that's the case, I would look for that in my products with the developers um, for static code t testing. To me, that would probably be more important. A lot of people like to go, well, you know, I've got this product over here who found, you know, 5% more vulnerabilities in this product, well, that's great, but if no one's using it, what's the point? I still have the one that has 5% fewer vulnerabilities but has perfect integration, and my developers will end up using it because it makes their life a little bit better in the long run. So to me, the word is always integration. Yeah. Yep, put it in the CI and let it run. Do you have your developers, uh, you, like, you know, doing a lot? Did you try to offload something to them, or...? Yep. Yep. And I think it's on the next slide. Trust but verify. There you go. That's exactly it. You defined it. You guys sounds like you guys are doing it. Perfect. Trust but verify. Make sure that no one's cheating the system. Because people will cheat. I mean, that's, that's kind of human nature. Anybody thinks that they won't, you know. It's tax season. I'm sure there's some people right now doing it.
Yeah. Yep. 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 You know, it, it, I think that's actually that's a great thing to throw in there. You know, you bring in you bring on somebody who's uh, who's been doing uh, basically secure coding long enough, and you throw them on the phone call, and then you say, okay, now explain it to this person, and all of a sudden things change. Uh oh, sorry. Yeah. Yep. It's very true. That's actually how I ended up, and when I was at Chase, that's how I ended up in security was because I had a little bit, I emphasize the key word little, I had a little bit of development experience in C. Uh, with what I was doing uh, at a previous role, uh, like two or three previous roles before that. And, and uh, um, yeah, that's kind of how I got into application security. And, and that's the other thing, too, is I found that, you know, finding a really good developer that I could pair up with was, was really valuable. And I've gotten really good at destroying code and, and being the bad guy than being the, the creator of great things. It's the reason why I have a lot of respect for when people can make secure code. And they're the people that, you know, I'm basically like, hey, let me buy you lunch today, you know. And, you had a question, sir? Well, just that, just that one subtlety on training, that's all. Um, I guess in a way, if I were going to, you know, take it and apply it to Agile, um, I would probably do, I guess it depends on how, to me it's that, that value of how much money will I spend to do it versus how much time. If the time requirements are little, I'd probably, you know, again, as a security person, I'd want to say I want to do it, you know, for the actual, you know, sprint that you're kind of in, right? Or, or at least, you know, leading up to it. Um, if... I don't have, if I don't have the finances or the time to do it, then probably what I'd do is I'd just make almost, kind of like back here, I'd almost make each one of these checkpoints when I get to really, you know, to certain stages like two, three, four, five, and six, I'd make those as, as points in my sprint. Definitely at the end, obviously, I want to do a manual test and verify. Um, but yeah, Agile does kind of throw it for a loop. Yeah. 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 Absolutely, and, and that's the thing. Like you said. Right there, when, you're, when I'm doing the static component of it, if I have my lead in there in the middle during the week, that person's kind of more or less running with it for at least during that sprint, and they're going to take the lead on it and, and essentially drive it home. Um, you know, the biggest thing is is that it just really gets back to, from a financial standpoint, you know, do I want to burn 100 hours on this project? Well, maybe it's worth 100 hours. You know, maybe this, this project, and again, maybe you only do five projects a year. But in some companies, they do 500 a year. Uh, you just have to build it to scale to a level that you're okay with. You know, maybe you only have one application security person. Where I was two jobs ago, um, that's basically what I was. I was I was the application security person, um, and and really it was only during their development cycles, which only happened um, 
over the summer months because of their cycle, they wouldn't do a whole lot of um, changes or, or much of anything over the winter. So essentially they were driving, you know, I kind of was in monitor mode for uh, one, two, and three over the summer, or excuse me, over the winter. And then when I take over things as, you know, four, five, and six over the summer when they're looking to deploy code and make lots of changes. Um, but again, it just depends on where you're at and, and what you're, you're willing to do. And, and during that time period, I could hit, you know, like 80 to 85 apps in a year, which means typically over a six month period, I only did maybe 40 some apps, which is typically how many they released. If I'm only going to do five, and, and again, I'm, I'm a huge company and, and all it is is five, well then, hey, dropping 500 hours on something may not be a big deal. Uh, it just depends. It, and again, that's where I was kind of leading with all this is you've got to, you've got to drive management towards that point of how much money are they willing to spend to get to, you know, a certain level of security. Lots of people think I've got to, I've got to bury them in, in, in all this fancy technology, but, you know, the management doesn't care. And half the time, I can't tell you how much technology I find sitting on a shelf, you know. Yeah, that's about what I was running with. The, the apartment I was in at that time had about 300 people, um, and we had about a, around 100 to 120 developers, I think. Um, they built a lot of their own custom code, so that's the reason why they were, uh, um, you know, that's why they were essentially, uh, you know, big into, you know, let's start doing our own security testing because nobody else is going to do it for us. Um, you know, and, and with what they were, their, their clientele was, it was, it was, uh, it was critical. They didn't. They didn't want to upset their clientele. So, but yeah, I'm not trying to pick on the last guy. I just my, his statement about training. I, I just didn't like. I think. I think that uh, saying I'm never going to train my developers is kind of a waste. You can train developers. He said, buy them lunch. It's that easy. It's like anyone else in technology. Buy them lunch, and you'll get you'll get an hour of their time. They'll at least shake their head up and down, right? I learned that in India. This means my ears are working. Thank you. Appreciate it. If you have any questions,